So what I'm saying, actually, you see, I mean, it's a combination of both. I mean, here it is the natural instinct, and here is control. You are to combine the two in harmony. Not if you have one to the extreme, you will be very unscientific. If you have another to the extreme, you become all of a sudden a mechanical man, no longer a human being. So you, it is a successful combination of both. So therefore, it is not only. I mean, so therefore, it's not pure naturalness or unnaturalness. The ideal is unnatural naturalness or natural unnaturalness. <laughs> Yin Yang, okay? right, man? That's it. <laughs> Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Powerful Thoughts, presented by T2 Tips Channel. Each series features an amazing audiobook that you can enjoy on the go, anytime, anywhere. Now, you've got an accessible, powerful tool to make a better version of you. If you're new here, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and make sure to turn on the notification bell to get more content like this in your feed. If you've enjoyed today's content, please like and share this with your friends. Also, check out our other episodes and follow us on our social media platforms. Now let's begin. 48 Loss of Power Written by Robert Greene and read by Don Leslie Law 48 Assume Formlessness Judgment By taking a shape, by having a visible plan, you open yourself to attack. Instead of taking a form for your enemy to grasp, keep yourself adaptable and on the move. Accept the fact that nothing is certain and no law is fixed. The best way to protect yourself is to be as fluid and formless as water. Never bet on stability or lasting order. Everything changes. But if you do not have styles, if you just say, well, here, here I am, you know, as, uh, as a human being, how can I express myself totally and completely? Now, that way, you won't create a style because style is a crystallization, you know. I mean, that way, it's a process of continuing growth. The hand-wise is very slow. Oh, is it? And you push it out, but all the time you are keeping the continuity going, bending stretching everything, you know, suppose, you know, I mean, you, you just keep it moving. It's like a belly dancer there. Yeah, it is. I mean, to, to them, you see, the idea is running water never grows stale. So you got to just keep on flowing. Observance of the law. When World War II ended and the Japanese, who had invaded China in 1937, had finally been thrown out, the Chinese nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, decided the time had come to annihilate the Chinese communists, their hated rivals, once and for all. They had almost succeeded in 1935, forcing the communists into the long march, the grueling retreat that had greatly diminished their numbers. Although the communists had recovered somewhat during the war against Japan, it would not be difficult to defeat them now. They controlled only isolated areas in the countryside, had unsophisticated weaponry, lacked any military experience or training beyond mountain fighting, and controlled no important parts of China, except areas of Manchuria, which they had managed to take after the Japanese retreat. Chang decided to commit his best forces in Manchuria. He would take over its major cities, and from those bases would spread through the northern industrial region, sweeping the communists away. Once Manchuria had fallen, the communists would collapse. In 1945 and 46, the plan worked perfectly. The nationalists easily took the major Manchurian cities. Puzzlingly, though, in the face of this critical campaign, the communists' strategy made no sense. When the nationalists began their push, the communists dispersed to Manchuria's most out-of-the-way corners. Their small units harassed the nationalist armies, ambushing them here, retreating unexpectedly there. But these dispersed units never linked up, making them hard to attack. They would seize a town, only to give it up a few weeks later. Forming neither rear guards nor vanguards, they moved like mercury, never staying in one place, elusive and formless. 
The nationalists ascribe this to two things, cowardice in the face of superior forces and inexperience in strategy. Mao Zedong, the communist leader, was more a poet and philosopher than a general, whereas Chang had studied warfare in the West and was a follower of the German military writer Karl von Clausewitz, among others. Yet a pattern did eventually emerge in Mao's attacks. After the nationalists had taken the cities, leaving the communists to occupy what was generally considered Manchuria's useless space, the communists started using that large space to surround the cities. If Chiang sent an army from one city to reinforce another, the communists would encircle the rescuing army. Chiang's forces were slowly broken into smaller and smaller units, isolated from one another, their lines of supply and communication cut. The nationalists still had superior firepower, but if they could not move, what good was it? A kind of terror overcame the nationalist soldiers. Commanders comfortably remote from the front lines might laugh at Mao, but the soldiers had fought the communists in the mountains and had come to fear their elusiveness. Now these soldiers sat in their cities and watched as their fast-moving enemies, as fluid as water, poured in on them from all sides. There seemed to be millions of them. The communists also encircled the soldiers' spirits, bombarding them with propaganda to lower their morale and pressure them to desert. The nationalists began to surrender in their minds. Their encircled and isolated cities started collapsing even before directly attacked. One after another fell in a quick succession. In November of 1948, the nationalists surrendered Manchuria to the communists, a humiliating blow to the technically superior nationalist army and one that proved decisive in the war. By the following year, the communists controlled all of China. Let your mind be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Interpretation. The two board games that best approximate the strategies of war are chess and the Asian game of Go. In chess, the board is small. In comparison to Go, the attack comes relatively quickly, forcing a decisive battle. It rarely pays to withdraw or to sacrifice your pieces, which must be concentrated at key areas. Go is much less formal. It is played on a large grid with 361 intersections, nearly six times as many positions as in chess. Black and white stones, one color for each side, are placed on the board's intersections, one at a time, wherever you like. Once all your stones, 52 for each side, are on the board, the object is to isolate the stones of your opponent by encircling them. A game of Go, called Wei Qi in China, can last up to 300 moves. The strategy is more subtle and fluid than chess, developing slowly, the more complex the pattern your stones initially create on the board, the harder it is for your opponent to understand your strategy. Fighting to control a particular area is not worth the trouble. You have to think in larger terms, to be prepared to sacrifice an area in order eventually to dominate the board. What you are after is not an entrenched position, but mobility. With mobility, you can isolate the opponent in small areas and then encircle them. The aim is not to kill off the opponent's pieces directly, as in chess, but to induce a kind of paralysis and collapse. Chess is linear, position-oriented, and aggressive. Go is non-linear and fluid. Aggression is indirect until the end of the game, when the winner can surround the opponent's stones at an accelerated pace. Chinese military strategists have been influenced by Go for centuries. Its proverbs have been applied to war time and again. Mao Zedong was an addict of Wei Qi, 
and its precepts were ingrained in his strategies. A key Wei Qi concept, for example, is to use the size of the board to your advantage, spreading out in every direction so that your opponent cannot fathom your movements in a simple, linear way. Every Chinese, Mao once wrote, should consciously throw himself into this war of a jigsaw pattern against the nationalists. Place your men in a jigsaw pattern and go, and your opponent loses himself trying to figure out what you are up to. Either he wastes time pursuing you, or, like Chiang Kai-shek, he assumes you are incompetent and fails to protect himself. And if he concentrates on single areas, as Western strategy advises, he becomes a sitting duck for encirclement. In the Wei Qi way of war, you encircle the enemy's brain, using mind games, propaganda, and irritation tactics to confuse and dishearten. This was the strategy of the communists, an apparent formlessness that disoriented and terrified their enemy. Where chess is linear and direct, the ancient game of Go is closer to the kind of strategy that will prove relevant in a world where battles are fought indirectly, in vast, loosely connected areas. Its strategies are abstract and multidimensional, inhabiting a plane beyond time and space, the strategist's mind. In this fluid form of warfare, you value movement over position. Your speed and mobility make it impossible to predict your moves. Unable to understand you, your enemy can form no strategy to defeat you. Instead of fixing on particular spots, this indirect form of warfare spreads out just as you can use the large and disconnected nature of the real world to your advantage. Be like a vapor. Do not give your opponents anything solid to attack. Watch as they exhaust themselves pursuing you, trying to cope with your elusiveness. Only formlessness allows you to truly surprise your enemies. By the time they figure out where you are and what you are up to, it is too late. Keys to Power The human animal is distinguished by its constant creation of forms. Rarely expressing its emotions directly, it gives them form through language or through socially acceptable rituals. We cannot communicate our emotions without a form. The forms that we create, however, change constantly, in fashion, in style, in all those human phenomena representing the mood of the moment. We are constantly altering the forms we have inherited from previous generations, and these changes are signs of life and vitality. Indeed, the things that don't change the forms that rigidify come to look to us like death, and we destroy them. The young show this most clearly, uncomfortable with the forms that society imposes upon them. Having no set identity, they play with their own characters, trying on a variety of masks and poses to express themselves. This is the vitality that drives the motor of form, creating constant changes in style. The powerful are often people who, in their youth, have shown immense creativity in expressing something new through a new form. Society grants them power because it hungers for and rewards this sort of newness. The problem comes later, when they often grow conservative and possessive. They no longer dream of creating new forms. Their identities are set, their habits congeal and their rigidity makes them easy targets. Everyone knows their next move. Instead of demanding respect, they elicit boredom. Get off the stage, we say. Let someone else, someone younger, entertain us. When locked in the past, the powerful look comical. They are overripe fruit waiting to fall from the tree. Power can only thrive if it is flexible in its forms. To be formless is not to be amorphous. Everything has a form. It is impossible to avoid. The formlessness of power is more like that of water or mercury taking the form of whatever is around it. Changing constantly, it is never predictable. 
The powerful are constantly creating form, and their power comes from the rapidity with which they can change. Their formlessness is in the eye of the enemy who cannot see what they are up to, and so has nothing solid to attack. This is the premier pose of power, ungraspable, as elusive and swift as the god Mercury, who could take any form he pleased and used his ability to wreak havoc on Mount Olympus. Human creations evolve toward abstraction, toward being more mental and less material. This evolution is clear in art, which, in this country, made the great discovery of abstraction and conceptualism. It can also be seen in politics, which over time have become less overtly violent, more complicated, indirect, and cerebral. Warfare and strategy, too, have followed this pattern. Strategy began in the manipulation of armies on land, positioning them in ordered formations. On land, strategy is relatively two-dimensional and controlled by topography. But all the great powers have eventually taken to the sea for commerce and colonization. And to protect their trading lanes, they have had to learn how to fight at sea. Maritime warfare requires tremendous creativity and abstract thinking, since the lines are constantly shifting. Naval captains distinguish themselves by their ability to adapt to the literal fluidity of the terrain and to confuse the enemy with an abstract, hard-to-anticipate form. They are operating in a third dimension, the mind. Back on land, Guerrilla Warfare 2 demonstrates this evolution toward abstraction. T. E. Lawrence was perhaps the first modern strategist to develop the theory behind this kind of warfare and to put it into practice. His ideas influenced Mao, who found in his writings an uncanny Western equivalent to Wei Qi. Lawrence was working with Arabs, fighting for their territory against the Turks. His idea was to make the Arabs blend into the vast desert, never providing a target, never collecting together in one place. As the Turks scrambled to fight this vaporous army, they spread themselves thin, wasting energy in moving from place to place. They had the superior firepower, but the Arabs kept the initiative by playing cat and mouse, giving the Turks nothing to hold on to, destroying their morale. Most wars were wars of contact, Ours should be a war of detachment, Lawrence wrote. We were to contain the enemy by the silent threat of a vast, unknown desert, not disclosing ourselves till we attacked. This is the ultimate form of strategy. The war of engagement has become far too dangerous and costly. Indirection and elusiveness yield far better results at a much lower cost. The main cost, in fact, is mental, the thinking it takes to align your forces in scattered patterns and to undermine the minds and psychology of your opponents. And nothing will infuriate and disorient them more than formlessness. In a world where wars of detachment are the order of the day, formlessness is crucial. The first psychological requirement of formlessness is to train yourself to take nothing personally never show any defensiveness. When you act defensive, you show your emotions, revealing a clear form. Your opponents will realize they have hit a nerve, an Achilles heel, and they will hit it again and again. So train yourself to take nothing personally. Never let anyone get your back up. Be like a slippery ball that cannot be held. Let no one know what gets you or where your weaknesses lie. Make your face a formless mask, and you will infuriate and disorient your scheming colleagues and opponents. One man who used this technique was Baron James Rothschild, a German Jew in Paris in a culture decidedly unfriendly to foreigners. Rothschild never took any attack on him personally or showed he had been hurt in any way. He furthermore adapted himself to the political climate, whatever it was the stiffly formal restoration monarchy of Louis XVIII, the bourgeois reign of Louis-Philippe, the democratic revolution of 1848, the upstart Louis-Napoleon crowned emperor in 1852. 
Rothschild accepted them one and all and blended in. He could afford to appear hypocritical or opportunistic because he was valued for his money, not his politics. His money was the currency of power. While he adapted and thrived, never showing a form, all the other great families that had begun the century immensely wealthy were ruined in the period's complicated shifts and turns of fortune. Attaching themselves to the past, they revealed their embrace of a form. Throughout history, the formless style of ruling has been most adeptly practiced by the queen who reigns alone. A queen is in a radically different position from a king. Because she is a woman, her subjects and courtiers are likely to doubt her ability to rule, her strength of character. If she favors one side in some ideological struggle, she is said to be acting out of emotional attachment. Yet, if she represses her emotions and plays the authoritarian in the male fashion, she arouses worse criticism still. Either by nature or by experience, then, queens tend to adopt a flexible style of governing that in the end often proves more powerful than the more direct male form. This feminine formless style of ruling may have emerged as a way of prospering under difficult circumstances, but it has proved immensely seductive to those who have served under it. Being fluid, it is relatively easy for its subjects to obey, for they feel less coerced, less bent to their ruler's ideology. It also opens up options where an adherence to a doctrine closes them off. Without committing to one side, it allows the ruler to play one enemy off another. Rigid rulers may seem strong, but with time, their inflexibility wears on the nerves and their subjects find ways to push them from the stage. Flexible, formless rulers will be much criticized, but they will endure, and people will eventually come to identify with them, since they are as their subjects are, changing with the wind, open to circumstance. Despite upsets and delays, the permeable style of power generally triumphs in the end. When you find yourself in conflict with someone stronger and more rigid, Allow them a momentary victory. Seem to bow to their superiority. Then, by being formless and adaptable, slowly insinuate yourself into their soul. This way, you will catch them off guard, for rigid people are always ready to ward off direct blows, but are helpless against the subtle and insinuating. To succeed at such a strategy, you must play the chameleon, conform on the surface, while breaking down your enemy from the inside. In evolution, largeness is often the first step toward extinction. What is immense and bloated has no mobility, but must constantly feed itself. The unintelligent are often seduced into believing that size connotes power. The bigger, the better. In 483 BC, King Xerxes of Persia invaded Greece believing he could conquer the country in one easy campaign. After all, he had the largest army ever assembled for one invasion. The historian Herodotus estimated it at over more than five million. The Persians planned to build a bridge across the Hellespont to overrun Greece from the land, while their equally immense navy would pin the Greek ships in harbor, preventing their forces from escaping to sea. The plan seemed sure, Yet, as Xerxes prepared the invasion, his advisor Artabanus warned his master of grave misgivings. The two mightiest powers in the world are against you, he said. Xerxes laughed. What powers could match his gigantic army? I will tell you what they are, answered Artabanus. The land and the sea. There are no safe harbors large enough to receive Xerxes' fleet, and the more land the Persians conquered, the longer their supply lines stretched, the more ruinous the cost of feeding this immense army would prove. Thinking his advisor a coward, Xerxes proceeded with his invasion. Yet, as Artabanus predicted, bad weather at sea decimated the Persian fleet, which was too large to take shelter in any harbor. On land, meanwhile, the Persian army destroyed everything in its path, 
which only made it impossible to feed, since the destruction included crops and stores of food. It was also an easy and slow-moving target. The Greeks practiced all kinds of deceptive maneuvers to disorient the Persians. Xerxes' eventual defeat at the hands of the Greek allies was an immense disaster. The story is emblematic of all those who sacrifice mobility for size. The flexible and fleet of foot will almost always win, for they have more strategic options. The more gigantic the enemy, the easier it is to induce collapse. The need for formlessness becomes greater the older we get, as we grow more likely to become set in our ways and assume too rigid a form. We become predictable, always the first sign of decrepitude, and predictability makes us appear comical. Although ridicule and disdain might seem mild forms of attack, they are actually potent weapons and will eventually erode the foundation of power. An enemy who does not respect you will grow bold, and boldness makes even the smallest animal dangerous. As you get older, you must rely even less on the past. Be vigilant, lest the form your character has taken makes you seem a relic. It is not a matter of mimicking the fashions of youth. That is equally worthy of laughter. Rather, your mind must constantly adapt to each circumstance, even the inevitable change that the time has come to move over and let those of younger age prepare for their ascendancy. Rigidity will only make you look uncannily like a cadaver. Never forget, though, that formlessness is a strategic pose. It gives you room to create tactical surprises. As your enemies struggle to guess your next move, they reveal their own strategy, putting them at a decided disadvantage. It keeps the initiative on your side, putting your enemies in the position of never acting, constantly reacting. It foils their spying and intelligence. Remember, formlessness is a tool. Never confuse it with a go-with-the-flow style or with a religious resignation to the twists of fortune. You use formlessness not because it creates inner harmony and peace, but because it will increase your power. To me, okay, to me, ultimately, martial art means honestly expressing yourself. Now, it is very difficult to do. I mean, it is easy for me to put on a show and be cocky yeah. and be flooded with a cocky feeling and then yeah. feel like pretty cool and all that. Or I can... Make all kinds of phony thing, you see what I mean? Blinded by it, or I can show you some f really fancy movement. But to express oneself honestly, not lying to oneself, and to express myself honestly, you know, that, my friend, is <laughs> very hard to do. And you have to train. You have to keep your reflexes so that when you want it, it's there. When you want to move, you're moving. And when you move, you are determined to move, not Taking one inch, not anything less than that. If I want to punch, I'm going to do it, man, and I'm going to do it. Finally, learning to adapt to each new circumstance means seeing events through your own eyes and often ignoring the advice that people constantly peddle your way. It means that ultimately you must throw out the laws that others preach and the books they write to tell you what to do and the sage advice of the elder. The laws that govern circumstances are abolished by new circumstances, Napoleon wrote, which means that it is up to you to gauge each new situation. Rely too much on other people's ideas, and you end up taking a form not of your own making. Too much respect for other people's wisdom will make you depreciate your own. Be brutal with the past, especially your own and have no respect for the philosophies that are foisted on you from outside.